Okay, I think we're up and going now. Hi, right, everybody out there. We're back. Part six of the off grid seminar. So, how's everybody doing? I hope everybody's doing well. All right, good to see everybody. So we will get started here. Um, and this, it's good to hear everybody's doing good or they're good. All right, in this part of the seminar, um, what we're going to be talking about is finding water, okay? Now I realize that I'm going to get, you know, people give me a hard time because of the way I say water, but uh, you want to know how water is spelled, it's W-O-O-D-E-R, water. So, my weird accent, I know, people say it's water, water, I guess is how they say it. Well, not from where I'm from, it's, I say water. So, I'm not going to try to correct it and say it the right way throughout the live stream, it's just going to come out water because that's how I was raised. So, my weird accent, sorry about that. Or if you're from the UK, it'd be wata, or whatever, however you say it there. So... Um, that's just the way it's going to be. But what do you do when you move off grid? You, you buy a house in town, you buy a place that has electricity, it already has a well mostly, or you buy like this place here in the town of Patton, it's hooked up to the town water supply. So, which is actually fluoridated and chlorinated, so we don't mess with it. Um, but what do you do? What do you do, excuse me, when you buy land someplace and there's no well on the property or whatever else okay um, how important is it well I would say it's probably one of the most important things um, you don't have to worry if you don't have a really good source of water on the property there's no drilled well or something like that it's not impossible to get it okay and I'm going to give you a lot of different options today again things I've experienced throughout my years of off-grid systems and, and looking at systems um, you know both in America and in other countries as well um, option number one which would be the easiest in terms of it works pretty much everywhere unless you live in the desert and that is rainwater catchment and I've even seen people in the deserts where you know uh, down the sort of the south west areas of America where it's really dry arid you know climates and whatever else and um, those people they have rainwater catchment and they have big systems because they don't get much rain and the rain that they do get they have to collect all of it and preserve it um, so rainwater catchment works it's a big thing in Hawaii because of the thing of you can't really drill wells when you're you know sitting on top of volcanoes um, and they get plenty of rainwater down there um, Pacific Northwest big thing up there because of how much rain they get um, Rainwater catchment pretty much works anywhere. This place, actually, this old house was built in 1930, and down in the basement, there's a big concrete um, area where they actually cut through it with a saw, and now you can walk through it, but originally it would have been a rainwater catchment cistern in the basement. I know my father told me when he was growing up, they had a rainwater catchment cistern as their source of water. Um, and they would have to go down and clean it out and everything else, keep it clean. And um, so it's a very common thing, very ancient. The Bible even talks about cisterns um, that to collect rainwater. It's a great way to do it. Um, I would stay away from it if you're in a high pollution type of area, like a city. If you're near a city, probably not a good idea to have rainwater catchment because of all the exhaust and everything else, the acid rain, they call it. Um, probably don't want to drink that. Um, I would never drink rainwater. I don't care how pure of an area and whatever else. Um, I would always filter it. But there's a lot of uses for rainwater catchment. And if it's filtered, um, we literally have a really good spring in our area here. 
and we've taken rainwater that we've you know collected and put it through a Berkey filter and then we take um, spring water and we try them both at the same time you can't tell the difference they both taste just as good as the other so um, rainwater catchment okay one inch of rain the the formula that you can how to determine how much you can collect one inch of rain plus 1,000 square feet um, of roof roof space equals 620 gallons of water okay 0.62 gallons per square foot in other words is the formula that you can do there so if you have a house that's 2,500 square feet and you have that much it covers the entire roof or whatever else you know length length times width you just take that and then you would multiply it um times uh 0.62 and that would give you how much rainwater catchment that you can get all right so that's a, a good calculation there that you can figure that out and again if you have a thousand square feet that's not even that big of a metal roof area just one inch of rain and you have 620 gallons of water that's a lot of water okay um now a cistern must be covered if you're using it for any kind of water, it should be covered or down in your basement or someplace. Um, it has to be covered to keep out things like um, dirt, bugs, animals. Um, we actually had just a old uh, galvanized tub catching the rainwater that was coming off of our one shed where we do our laundry. And um, we had a moose and, and he would go down and drink right out of it. <laughs> and it's kind of, a, well, you know, uh, probably not real bad, you know, not real toxic, but, you know, moose slobbers and things in our rainwater catchment. Yeah, I don't know. Might make the clothes come out a little bit uh, sticky or something. I don't know. But uh, you, you want to keep them covered. A um, little funny story. When I was in Honduras the one time, um, was one of the guys that came down with us um, from America, um, real mechanically inclined, really smart guy mechanical wise and, and um he would he went with some other people we were at the one area and then he was we were together for a while and then um we went he went some way and then we went another way and then we were going to meet up later on down there and he went actually out to a camp where they would have like a youth camp and whatever down there in honduras i forget the area where it was um where in honduras in other words but uh wherever it was, they had rainwater catchment as their main source of water. And they said that people were saying, you know, that something tastes really funny about the water. It just something smells a little off, it tastes a little bit weird, whatever. And he said, well, you know, if you have a ladder, I'll get up, I'll climb up there and check it. It was kind of up high up and then it gravity fed down into the spigots and everything. And he said, yeah, you know, I'll climb up there, take the lid off or take the roof off of it. And I'll, I'll get in there and I'll, I'll look and see what's going on. And so he gets up there, takes the roof off of this rainwater catchment tank and uh, looks down in there and this big lizard <laughs> had died and it somehow got down in there. And he said it was dead laying in there all rotted and decomposed. And he said, I think that's why the water tastes a little bit funny right now. It smells a little weird. So <laughs> that's the problem. So um, you have to be very careful about making sure that your rainwater stays nice and clean. Um, and you'd be surprised. I mean, I've literally had times where we just were using it for doing laundry and whatever. So we don't care if there's some leaves floating in it and, and things like that. And it will oftentimes look really, uh, you know, if it's exposed to sunlight, that's another thing too. You'll get some algae growth, you know, get a little bit green and things around the edges, but you scoop the water out, it's crystal clear and it's fine. It doesn't have a weird odor to it or anything else. So rainwater is a really good thing. And, um, and like I said, if you're going to do rainwater catchment, you have to make sure that it's a metal. Um, I'll show you here real quickly. Uh, black plastic like these here. Uh, this would be good. This one's bad right here because it's sort of translucent. It's not transparent, but like clear in other words, but it would let sunlight in. And so it would start turning green over time. Um, again, you have these. These galvanized ones like this, not the best because galvanized, the it's a chemical coating on the metal and it can eventually start to leach into the water. Um, I know plastic has its own issues, but usually plastic um, 
the bisphenol A in it, you see BPA free bisphenol A is what it is. It's a synthetic female hormone. Not the best to have, you know, in plastic there, but uh, bisphenol, bisphenol A can leach into the water from plastic if it's heated. Okay. Now, usually if it's cold, it's not going to leach any chemicals into the water. Um, a very simple uh, way to say it is, I heard somebody say this years ago, and I thought that's pretty good. They said if you can taste a plastic taste in whatever you're drinking out of, and it's plastic, then you're drinking the chemicals. Okay. Better think about that. I remember I was when I heard that I actually had um, a plastic mug like you could put coffee in it or hot tea or hot chocolate or whatever else, and then you know, you take it with you, you know. And and I remember I was drinking it the one time. I thought, man, it really tastes like plastic. And then I heard that saying and i thought oh you know i'm actually drinking chemicals that's not too good so but rainwater catchment is a very good option um you can see a lot of the different types of rainwater catchment systems here you know you have your standard like the rain barrel like that that just goes your rain gutter comes down you can go right into it and you can put a little spigot down there with a garden hose attachment that's one way that you can do it. There's another one that's kind of similar. Rain gutter coming in here in the top, goes down in, you have a spigot there. There's an overflow right there. Um, another option, it's a smaller, kind of a smaller one, but you can you can get some of these things. Um, I'll just see here. Yeah, there's a 1,700 gallon right there, 2,500 gallon, 1,100 gallon. You know, there's one 5,000 gallon rainwater catchment. Um, I mean, you can get some big ones. Um, so another thing to think about there, um, you know, there's a large rainwater harvesting system. That's a pretty big system there that they're putting in, you know, quite a few thousand gallons on that one. Um, but one thing that you do have to look into is the possibility of, uh, it might not even be legal in some areas. I know that there are certain areas uh, that are banning the thing of catching rainwater because then you're saying they're saying you're keeping it from going into the ground, which will hurt the local farms in the area. It doesn't it hurts the aquifer. The water doesn't go down into the aquifer and all this other stuff. So you can get in trouble for catching your own what rainwater on your own property. But again, you know, do it in a way that they can't see it, quite frankly, because nobody should be telling you that you can't uh, collect your own rainwater. Um, another thing uh, to think about, if you have, I mean, this is an extreme example right there. Okay, that's, I don't even know what that would be. Probably hundreds of thousands of gallons of, of rainwater storage right there. But, I mean, that's, we'll just, I won't show that one because that's kind of extreme. But this thing here, you know, uh, probably would be around a thousand or maybe I shouldn't say a thousand, probably about from the looks of it, the compared to the house, maybe 5,000 gallons. I don't know. It, I don't know if it really says on there. Not really that important. The point is, if that thing's full and you have 5,000 gallons of water, all of a sudden there's a forest fire coming into the area. You have access to 5,000 gallons of water to fight that fire. Tell the fire department, hey, come on in. I have 5,000 gallons of water. <laughs> All right, that's a lot of water. However, if you have a drilled well like this, little well there, and it's going down into the aquifer, we'll talk more about that here in a minute. If you have that, you can drain that aquifer pretty quickly. Uh, one of my former neighbors um, actually had his toilet, the little flapper thing inside the tank on the back of the toilet, the flapper stuck open. And he went away someplace, came back, and he heard some weird noises. And he went in, and, and oh, man, the thing's open. And it was just still running. And I guess it was still just a trickle by then. And he said it basically dried out as well. And he had to, you know, wait for a while. And thankfully, the aquifer came back up again, um, and everything was okay. But um, he didn't have a very strong well. And a couple times it went dry, and he had to wait a number of hours and maybe even a day or so for it to come back. And I've heard of people that, that uh, they actually will make their well go dry and 
it doesn't come back and you have to have it re-drilled or, you know, drilled in a new spot or something. So, you know, cisterns, one of their biggest benefits is you have access to thousands of gallons of water. Um, the problem is they are dependent on rain. So if you live in an area of low rainfall or if you have a drought, you can be in a lot of trouble. So I think that the smart thing to do, I'll kind of get ahead of myself here a little bit, but the smart thing to do when it comes to an off-grid homestead is you need, to have, you need to have multiple sources of water, not just a drilled well or a spring on your property or a rainwater catchment system. You should have multiple systems in case one fails. Um, I think that's a smart thing to do. That's what we do. Um, another thing that you have to remember, okay, right here, this one is showing a shingled roof. Terrible idea, okay? If you collect rainwater catchment from a shingled roof, there's little little grit there that comes off a shingled roof, will get down into your cistern, and it starts to make it, you know, get kind of a sulfur type of smell to it, and bad news. I know people that use it. Um, there are people I've met. Uh, places I've gone to where they, you know, they have rainwater catchment and it comes off of a shingled roof, but not the best. You really would like, it, it, you'd be better off with having a metal roof where you're not going to get, you know, a lot of stuff coming off of your shingles and whatever else. Um, the other thing is, uh, where is your house located? Where is your place at? If it's back in the woods, Back under a lot of trees where well, you're going to be dealing with leaf litter, you're going to be dealing with birds going in your rain gutter, your rain water ca catchment system, um, going to the bathroom, you know, um, you're going to be dealing with a lot of dirt getting into that. Even if you put guard gutter guards on and you're trying to keep stuff out of it, you're still going to have to deal with a lot of it. Um, that's one of the downsides. Where we do our rainwater catchment, there are no trees anywhere near the water that we're catching. So we really don't get any that many leaves in unless it's really blowing hard and might blow some up into the tank or whatever else. So that's another thing to think about. And it's very important. Um, so um, another thing uh, with this place right here, our house here, originally the way it was built with the cistern in the basement, um, it would have needed some kind of electric pump or whatever to get the water up to the faucets and everything else. But it also had a unique system where it was an old wood stove in the basement and, and a big, huge old wood stove. It's still down there. But unfortunately, the it had a thermal siphoning system where the pipes kind of went like this up and down. And then it went up through. So the water came out of the cistern into the back of the wood stove. And then it went upstairs to the radiant heat throughout the house. And so it's pooling water because the as the stove gets hot, it heats up the water. The water, the hot water rises up, goes up through the system, and then it comes back down in, I guess, back into the cistern, or or maybe it just I'm not even sure with the heat system. But it worked very well. And then they got rid of the cistern in the basement, hooked up to the town water, and the fluoride. Um, fluoride is extremely corrosive and it actually corroded the pipes inside the stove and it ruined the stove. So, and then they put in a wood powered furnace, uh, I think with oil backup heat and that's still down the basement too. <laughs> Need to get this stuff out scrap value, I guess, but it's going to be a real treat to, I'll have to cut them up. There's no way I'm carrying these big things out, but, um, that was ruined as well. You can see where the pipes ate through and burst. And now we just have an oil furnace downstairs. There's nothing, any kind of a setup there for wood. And that thing will probably go bad eventually, too. I mean, there's a, um, up in the town of Holton, up from us, there's a, um, the Holton Hannaford, I think it is. No, I'm sorry. No, it's Andy's IGA in Holton. And um, the bathroom that they have for the public to use, you go back in and it's kind of back into the right. You go back in there and the spigot. The, the faucet where the base is at it's got these huge holes eaten through it why because of the fluoridated water my grandparents down in pennsylvania years ago before they died um i had to replace their kitchen faucet uh because it was just totally eaten out because of the fluoride sodium fluoride will eat through metal like that but it's good for your teeth yeah right uh no it's not 
very bad for your teeth. Uh, study that issue if you don't know about that. So rainwater catchment is a really good thing. I think even if you have um, a drilled well or whatever else, I think rainwater catchment is a really smart thing to do. Even if you're on grid again, the grid goes down, you need water. What do you do? Rainwater catchment is a very smart thing to do. Um, and another story, I'll say this quickly, that uh, my wife, her childhood home that she grew up in, it was an old farm uh, from the 1800s, late 1800s, and it had the rainwater cistern. And they eventually uh, had a well, a drilled well, but then uh, because of all the irrigation out in the Midwest there and everything, they started to dry up the aquifer out there. And so the a lot of the people, the old farms that had the drilled wells, the drilled wells don't work anymore. So then they had to put in the town water and they it was fluoridated. And she said if they put the fluoridated water on the plants in her parents' house, it would kill the plants. Another good argument for giving, you know, putting in people's water supply. But it would kill the house plants, so they actually put a rainwater catchment system outside, and they would water their plants with the rainwater catchment, and the plants did great. So again, if you're in an area and you are unfortunate in that you have fluoridated water or chlorinated as well, um, and that's all that's available, well, then put in some rainwater catchment and you could filter it and uh, you know, water your plants for with it or whatever else. I would recommend that. Okay, another option, which I talked about before, is a drilled well. Okay, if you've seen these little well pipes in people's yards, that's what that is if you're not aware of that. Um, the problem with that is it requires a lot of things. Okay, if you have it, drilled down into there down in here would be the aquifer you can see them in this picture here you're going through different types of soil and rock and whatever else then you have to put a submersible pump in there and it says uh and then the the drop pipe going down into there and you the well casing is this big pipe that goes down in the well head and cap there's a wire that goes down to run the pump which can always break or if the power outage well then you're kind of in trouble there but that goes out and it goes into the pressure switch the and to the um fuse panel and then inside you have to have a pressure tank so there's a bunch of things right there all of which can go bad and you know usually they don't it's not like it's going to go bad every week it goes bad or something no it'll work for many years but again if you're in an off-grid situation and you're starting from scratch might not be the best idea and the other thing is if you're at a high elevation um, again, you're going to be running into some trouble there because higher elevations are going to be typically the water is going to be a lot lower down in. And you might go down in 400 feet before you hit water. And um, I, one of my neighbors told me where our property is. He said, you go down in about, I forget what he said, you know, four, four to six feet. And he said, you're just going to hit solid rock ledge. You know, I think he said down there. And he said, that's what you're going to hit when you drill for a well. It's not really that great. And, um, you know, again, if you have a, a well driller come and they're starting to drill down through that, well, they're, you're going to get charged for that. And, you know, they can drill. And if they don't hit any water, they might have to try someplace else. But each time they're poking down in there, you know, with their drill, um, you're going to be having to spend money for that. So it can get quite expensive. I've heard of, you know, bad stories of people who are spending multiple thousands of dollars you know, maybe even over ten, twenty thousand dollars on getting their well drilled. Well, that's a, a lot of money. So um, it's an option. Uh, again, if you go there and there's an old house site and there's an old drilled well and it works, you check it. Hey, the water's pretty good. Again, a lot of times underneath this this cal this cap here, excuse me, the the well cap. If you flip it, if you take it off. There's little set screws that hold it on. You take, you back them out, and then you, um, not out the whole way, but you know, he you just loosen them enough that it comes off, and you can look underneath, and it'll usually they'll write in marker, like black marker, how many feet down it is, and the gallons per minute, is what you'll find underneath that. And if you have one of those, and you want to be off grid, you don't want the electric thing, then one of the things that you can do, here is you can get a Bison deep well pump. Uh, most of your the little hand pumps and things, they don't work going 
down a couple hundred feet. These things go down, they can go down pretty far. I don't remember the exact amount that this, you know, that they said about here, but um, they're actually made right up here in Northern Maine. And I've used a couple of them. We don't own one on our property. There are some, you know, that I've used in the area. There's a park where they have one and you can use it. And uh, they work really well. They're really good. Um, and they don't freeze. You can use them pretty much all year round. I think that you have to do some things, take certain things out, whatever else, so it doesn't freeze up inside there. Um, but uh, um, so yeah, um, that's another option. Um, having a a uh, drilled well, and then you can um, put a hand pump on it. That's another thing there. Um, and we'll get to another one here. All right, I had to take care of a troll over there. Um, natural spring. What about a natural spring? Again, I had this little stock photo thing up here when we first got started. Um, this one here, you can see it's going into some sort of a stone thing. It's just a picture, you know, you can get off the internet there but it's an old pipe that comes out and then the spring water it gets up to a certain point and it flows out the pipe and um, when i was a boy we um went back in the woods there was the uh strasburg township down in lancaster county pennsylvania they had what they called the watershed their watershed which is basically if you have hills coming down into a valley and a stream in the valley typically you can have some really good you know supply of water down in there well, they did. They had multiple springs, and then what they did is they capped them with concrete, uh, those springs, and then the, the water would fill up, and it would go out overflow pipes if there was a lot of it. But they piped it down and into the town of Strasburg. And um, so we called it, we'd say, let's go back to the springs um, because there were multiple capped springs back in there. And uh, I so I, as a child, it was just a normal thing. You'd go down there in the summer months, um, a lot of times the spring would be running really well and it just looked like that. It was a, it was a pipe that came out of the one capped well, and it was, it was actually pretty big. It was probably four or five inch pipe, like casing pipe, well casing pipe coming out. And it was just really flowing out of there. A lot of times, I mean, sometimes it was almost the whole pipe diameter coming out I mean, it really came out there and we'd play in the water and stuff as, as children. And we, make little rock things to splash the water in some other direction or you know we had a great time with it but you could drink it and it was you know really good to drink so i was kind of raised with that and uh i remember you know different times i'd show people that are not familiar with springs you know this type of a thing and it just runs all the time and they think well do you have to shut it off or something or you know, how do you turn it off or something no it's just it runs all the time <laughs> so um that's another thing that you can do. There's another picture. This is a little, looks a little bit cleaner there. A PVC pipe coming out with a, some spring water pouring out of it. And they just have a rock right there so it doesn't eat out the ground. And, um, you know, we have one similar, it's very similar to that in our area here. And it pretty much is flowing um, from, I would say, Usually it'll start up again in, in September and then it runs the whole way to probably about June, July, somewhere in there is when it'll start to dry up. It'll start to get down to more of a trickle, but it runs most of the year. And I mean, you can go in the dead of winter, it can be 30 degrees below zero and you go and you can dig out and you, you know, you can, you'll hear it before you see it sometimes because the snow plows, they'll cover it, it's right along the road. And um, you have to go and you, you dig it out and everything and, and uh, you'll hear the water trickling in there and it just runs all the time. And it's, you know, it'll stay between 40 and 50 degrees year round. Uh, really amazing. And people have been going there for years and, and um, most of the people in the area get their drinking water there. And you can fill up. And uh, what we've done for a while is we have a big tank that we use, 360 gallons, I think. And um, we'll go and we'll fill it up in the spring and then we'll just keep that tank in, you know, hidden um, in so it's not getting, a, you know, exposed to sunlight, I'm saying. And then, um, you know, we're 
what we do then is when the, the spring dries up, then we have, we just start to use out of that 360 gallons of water and we're very conservative with it. Um, but then we can also use rainwater catchment as well. So there's different options there. Um, we did actually find a side hill seep, which is a type of spring. You have springs that come up, and then you have springs that come out. So if you have like a hill coming down like this, and you can sometimes have a spring and it seeps and it goes down the hill like that. Well, that's what we found on our property. We have one like that. We also have a little spring fed pond that's pretty much always running. So we have two different springs there as water sources. The side hill seep, it's again, without going into a huge big thing there, you can, if you find water coming out of the side of a hill, um, it's a source of water. Now you might, if you want to get it checked or whatever, that might be a good idea just in case it might not be totally safe or whatever might be a good idea. Just make sure it's good, clean water. And if there's no chemicals in the, in the ground that are polluting it. But if you find something and especially, especially if you see a lot of animals drinking from it, usually that's a good indication. Um, but you know, little, you know, tadpoles in it in the springtime, you know, turn into frogs or whatever there, there's life in it and things that's usually pretty good. Um, but what you can do is that side hill seep, you can build up, you can kind of dam it up. And then so the water starts to rise up and then you can have a pipe that flows out and you can cap it and then send that pipe down a hill and then eventually come out like this picture right here. And then you can just take your jugs down and, and whatever. And again, if you saw the, um, if you saw the video that I did about, you know, running water and whatever else, different things. And I talked about the blue reliance jugs. That's what we use. That's how you wash your hands. It was on a hygiene is what it was. So you can get the, the blue jugs, any kind of water jugs, fill them up at the spring. And there you have your running water. Uh, it works very well. Um, like I said, it's iffy. It's, it's going to be probably the best, most clean water that you can get unless there's chemical pollution in the area. Um, but the problem with most springs is that they will dry up at some point in time through the year. Um, there are some that that's not the way it is. I mean, we had a big spring over on our property when we first bought our property in Littleton, Maine. And um, that spring never dried up. I mean, we went through droughts where the ground had cracks in it. I mean, it was really dry those years. The grasses, you know, people's yards were just brown. And our spring just ran nonstop and it ran, you know, 365 days a year, never dried up. There are some that are like that. Again, others will dry up in the summer typically. So, um, so just something to think about there. Another way that you can get water is from a river, a stream, a creek, a brook, whatever, or a lake. Um, and again, you're going to be there in that situation. You have to be extremely careful because um, there are, uh, you know, springs that I know of that originate up in the mountain, not far from where our property is, and they come down and they form into a creek. And it's crystal clear. But the problem is, as it gets out of the mountain, the side of the mountain, it's pure. But it starts to come down through the woods, and now... Mr. Moose decides to go walking by and he, you know, has to go to the bathroom or something. And then that gets into the water and then this gets into it and cars go by and they're, you know, splashing antifreeze out, oil out. And they, that the rain water washes it down into the creek. And then in the winter time, they put the salt and the other sludge on the road to melt the ice and the snow. And that gets into the water. And so by the time you get pretty far away down the creek, it still might look really nice and clean, but it's got a lot of things added to it. So what, you know, can you use it to wash laundry? Can you use it to do things like that? Yes, you could, but it's iffy. You get into lakes, um, most lakes, if there are boats anywhere nearby, if they can drive, drive boats back through motorized boats, the exhaust from those motors, the outboard motors gets into the lake. It's, they're not very clean. There's a lot of mercury and, and everything else in it. Um, so you have to be really careful about that. Um, again, if you have your own spring fed pond on your property, it might be pretty clean and you might be okay using some of that for water, for whatever. If you have to drink it, definitely filter it. 
uh, would be the thing. So if you're looking for land and you look and, hey, there's a really beautiful stream in the back, where's the source of it? How far up does it go? Oh, it's actually on our property. Oh, okay. Hmm. That'd be good. Or, well, it goes up in and it goes through a farm and whatever. Oh, does the farm use fertilizer? Do, do they use other things? Is it runoff from livestock? All things to consider. Um, if it's, you know, hey, we have a spring fed pond on our property. Um, well, great. That might be a good place where you can go and, and get some clean water and use it for laundry or whatever else, but still you'd want to filter it. And uh, the other thing would be that uh, would be possible for an off-grid homestead would be hauling water from a place that sells it. So I've heard of people doing that. There are springs and things that are really powerful, really strong, and you go and you can fill up your jugs there and you only pay a little bit of money for, you know, filling up the jugs and, and whatnot. Um, I actually knew a place where my grandparents used to go. They would get spring water from a place and you would go in there and I think it was 25 cents per gallon or something like that. And so people would just take their old milk jugs, you know, gallon, one gallon milk jugs, and they'd go in there, you know, clean them out first, obviously. <coughs> but they would put a quarter in the machine and then it would open up the thing and you could put it in there and fill it up with spring water and keep doing it that way. And, and so it was, you know, a pretty cheap way to do it. You can do it that way. Haul your water into your homestead. Um, that's a way that you can do it. And you can get by just fine if it's just your drinking water, you're washing your dishes, brushing your teeth, washing your hands, whatever. But then you start getting into the thing of washing your clothing and up goes your water usage. Um, and especially then if you get livestock, you can't tell the you know, your milk cow, you know, don't drink very much. We don't have much here. You know, we have to pay for it or something. <laughs> you need to have a better source of water for livestock. So that should cover, I think, everything on my list here. So um, <clears throat> I can go over some questions. And uh, the person that I... Uh, block there they said i'm a jesuit okay uh no i'm not uh you know they, they people said that and it's the dumbest thing out there i mean give me a break so okay uh let's see here post this comment question on your last video did you mention anything about deodorant and do you you all use any most deodorants are aluminum which is highly toxic any recommendations i did talk about the thing of deodorant um we do not use store brand deodorant um there's a lot of different things that you can do you can um just use regular baking soda i've done that you can use a white vinegar watered down a little bit spray that um cornstarch with different types of um things in it and you know, like dried powder. We actually took wild mint leaves the one time and, and ground them up, dried them, and then ground them up. And that made kind of an interesting deodorant. So there's different things that you can do. But a lot of the thing of deodorant is that you want to get toxic food and toxic stuff detoxified out of your body. You won't smell as bad when you sweat. I know that might sound weird, but it's, it's true. Um, <clears throat> Uh, question did you cover ram pumps for moving water without electricity no i did not i don't even know if i i might have missed that yes i did i did miss that thank you brother matthew um yes ram pumps that's another thing you can actually move water uphill so you could actually put if you have a spring we'll say you could actually use a ram pump and pump water without electricity up to a tank in the upstairs part of your house and then gravity feed it down through. Um, <clears throat> and again, I don't know. I don't have any experience with ram pumps. I don't know anything about it. I actually knew an Amish family in the area that um, they didn't have a ram pump, but they used a gas-powered pump. And so they would, you know, they had a tank upstairs. They did some thermal siphoning with their wood cook stove, and it was just a simple matter of okay, well the tank's getting a little bit low. Go fire up the gas. You know, it's a Honda, you know, water pump, and they could pump. The little small Honda, I forget the model number, but it's a, it can actually pump, I think, 15 feet straight up. And so they you just go out there and fire the thing up and 
pump water up into the tank and then once the tank's full you know somebody upstairs would yell okay you know <laughs> and he'd shut off the pump and the water would come back down they drain the water out of the pump so it doesn't freeze or whatever else that's another possibility so um it, it, remember that most people around the world do not have running water all the time too so if they can do it you can do it again if you're trying to have a simple life off grid just learn from other people in other countries they're doing it and they function just fine okay Question, do you think we will see wormwood hit Asia? I ask this because it will poison the ocean waters and the only source will be well water. Um, well, when you when you start getting into um, when you start getting into the thing of Bible prophecy, it, it, sell, it says about the springs and things becoming blood. So it's not just going to be the wormwood thing. It's going to be a bad time. People are going to be running out of water. It's, it's a good point, but you know, somebody going trying to go off grid right now. Um, not really an issue for them. Um, have you looked into how they drill wells in the Philippines? No, I have not. I'm ignorant on that one. I do not know. <clears throat> um, uh, question, have you heard of these tablets you put in the water and cleanse it? Yes, I have. Um, iodine, I think it is. Uh, yeah, that you can... Put in it. I remember reading this guy who was in special operations and um, he was in Vietnam and uh, he said that they were they couldn't find any good clean water and he said there was like a puddle and and he took his canteen and he you know just got some water kind of tried to strain put his hand there and try to keep big stuff from floating into his canteen and looked in and it's just ugh. and he said he put an iodine tablet in it shook it up so it dissolved and he thought well here we go and he said he was drinking it and he could feel he was drinking, you know, clumps of stuff going down in and had to have water. So, uh, but, you know, in long term type of thing, yeah, you really wouldn't want to do that. Um, do you filter the spring water? I know, dumb question. That's not, not a dumb question. Uh, no, we don't. No. Um, You'll learn pretty quickly. Uh, you know, if if it's bad, you'll you'll start to feel it. You'll smell it. You'll you know get sick and whatever. I mean, we've been drinking the spring water for years, and people have been drinking it a lot longer than we were around. So, um, question: What do you say to the brethren that think this isn't necessary because we are to trust to take the Lord trust trust the Lord to take care of all of our needs? Um, in terms of being off grid. Uh, well, you know, the Bible talks about the prudent man foreseeing the evil and hiding himself, but the simple being, you know, passing on and being punished. Uh, if you see bad times coming, it would be wise to leave and to move and, you know, go someplace else. And being an off grid, you know, person, I mean, let's just look at the, the situation right now, okay, with the economy. Um, what I'm seeing here is uh, I was watching it. I watch a lot of financial type of stuff just simply because I'm trying to see, okay, what's the next move? How close are we to the mark of the beast thing? I'm, I'm watching so I can warn the body of Christ. And they want very badly to bring out a central bank digital currency because central bank digital currency can be tied to social credit scores and they can shut you down. And if you've been keeping up with this trucking thing in Canada, um, you know, oh, you're funding the protesters, whatever. Well, we're going to lock your bank account down. Okay, uh, that's a tactic of warfare, cutting off supplies to people. Truckers go, you know, and they're protesting and all this other stuff. Well, that's going to cut off supply chain. And uh, interesting, tomorrow on 2-22 of 2022, uh, kind of an interesting thing there, um, they're going to be starting the trucking protest in America. And they're going to drive to Washington, D.C. And we're already having problems with our supply chain. And all of a sudden, the truckers are all going to Washington, D.C. There goes the supply chain issue. It's going to trigger a lot of bad stuff happening. So, you know, there's some nasty things coming. 
But also this year, we have the midterm election cycle, which people are really upset with the Democrats right now. And I don't believe in the Democrat Republican thing. It's all just controlled. It's, you know, selections. It's not elections. It's selections. But think about this whole thing. Okay. If they don't do something about the economy soon, I mean, they just keep injecting money. You know, the Federal Reserve keeps injecting money in and you're going to eventually have hyperinflation. It happens every single time. The Weimar Republic, Zimbabwe, you know, all the different countries that have done just to keep injecting cash, it causes hyperinflation. Well, then they should let the stock market crash. But that will lead to other things. Well, if they have to redo the currency, you have to go back to a gold, gold and silver standard basically to redo the currency. So if they can do a central bank digital currency, you know, how do they bring that thing in right now? That's the question. And they might be able to just keep the debt system going if they just kind of say, uh, yeah, we're not basing it on gold or you know actual physical wealth anymore. We'll just kind of keep things going and whatever. And so it's a weird situation with the this election coming up in the fall. And then you have the trucker protest thing, cutting off supply chain. So, oh, well, we'll just trust the Lord through the whole thing. Well, yeah, trust the Lord. But if you're in a bad situation, you better get to some place where it's going to be safe. And if you're in a bad situation and you say, well, I can't get to some place where it's safe. OK, then start to implement some off grid type of stuff. Um, if you have to get away from the economic situation, take your money out of the banks and put it into physical assets and whatever else. To protect yourself, do that and do it soon, by the way. A lot of the banks are closing and just banker holidays and whatever else. Banking holiday, by the way, if you don't know, it means that they go on holiday. Like they say over in the UK, I'm on vacation. They're just not there. So you come in and you say, hey, I need money to, to buy groceries. Sorry, we're closed right now. now. I mean, I've seen it, seen it here with our local bank where they're just closed for no reason. People say they go to the ATM and try to get out money and sorry, it's there's no money. So, you, you know, trust the Lord. Absolutely. But you don't trust the Lord to keep the system going that he prophesied would fall apart. That doesn't make any sense. So little rant there, but uh, something to think about. Um, question, do you use your solar system to pump water? No, absolutely not. We do not have a drilled well. Um, how long does it take you to do your washing and how often do you do it? I was unable to watch your last video live. Um, the, the laundry thing, it takes longer. I'm not going to lie and say, oh, it's just as quick as a washing machine. No, it's not. Um, but it's a time that we can be together as family and we can enjoy it. It doesn't take a huge amount of time. You can probably get a load of laundry done in, you know, anywhere from 15 minutes to a half hour. Um, not a big deal. We don't do a huge amount of laundry and whatever else. For that reason, we're very careful um, how often we do it. Um, question. Have uh, you ever seen those videos with those guys digging underground homes with just a simple tool? YouTube, underground homes. Uh, oh, the... the Eastern guys or whatever, the Filipinos or whatever. I, I have, but it's kind of, okay, could you live in the thing and whatever? I don't know. Um, question, dear brother, do you know how long you can keep water? God bless you. Good question. Very good question. Um, if you're going to keep water for a long time, you have to keep it in an area that is not going to, that they won't be exposed to direct sunlight. If it's a lit room or whatever, that's fine. It doesn't have to be in a dark basement or something like that. But you have to keep them away from direct sunlight, especially if it's a clear container. Because if it's a clear container, it's going to start getting algae growth in it. Um, people say, well, you can just take a few drops of bleach and put it in there, and then that'll kill any bacteria or whatever else. Well, yes, but bleach, Clorox uh, bleach is carcinogenic. It can give you cancer. So... You say, well, in small amounts, well, no, not in small amounts, but it's still, it's not really the best stuff to put in there. Um, one thing that I've done over the years, just to let you know, is uh, there are also metals that are antibacterial. Uh, the best known one would be silver, pure silver, not junk silver like the early coins, the peace dollar, the Morgan dollar, the silver quarters, the silver dimes, 
that were actual currency here in America or whatever your country is. Those aren't pure silver or sterling silver. That's not pure silver. You get a pure silver round, 0.999 silver, or like the Canadian maple leaf is 0.999. Nine, excuse me, nine, it's four nine silver. You get one of those coins, like a one ounce coin or something, and you put it down into your water containment, your water jug or whatever else, and that silver will actually kill any kind of bacteria in there. And, um, you know, a lot of people will do the, the thing of um, like the colloidal silver and whatever else. Well, our Berkey that we used to have that we would use. We would actually store silver coins in the bottom part of it. You know, the top part where you put the water in and the charcoal filters are up there. They go down through, and then we would actually put our silver coins down in the bottom of the Berkey, bottom part of it. And we have a stainless steel one, so you couldn't even see it there in there. So good place to store your, your silver. Make sure it's clean first. Get all the oils off of it and everything. Sterilize them in really hot water. And after they're cooled down, put them into your lower part of your water filter. and just them being in there, um, we didn't get colds ever drinking that water. So one way that you can do it there, use silver coins to purify your water. Um, that's a more natural way than using Clorox bleach, which I don't really uh, recommend that. Um, and as far as keeping the water, you can pretty much do that indefinitely. I actually heard there was an ancient culture the one time that they actually had urns made to store water and the urns were made out of solid silver. So it'd be a little bit expensive nowadays though. Question, filtering versus boiling water, which is better for purification? I remember reading somewhere that boiling water increases fluoride concentration. Yeah, depending on what's in the water, boiling it's not the best idea. I mean, when I was in, uh, when I was in um, Costa Rica, they would boil the water down there before they would you know, make anything for us, you know, they, they have the infamous Montezuma's Revenge down there. Um, so <laughs> they would always boil it. Um, but uh, okay. You can boil poison water and it will still be poison. Uh, filtering is great. Use both together and I think you're golden. In most cases, yeah, you probably would be okay with that. Um, what do you think about fiberglass cisterns? The fiberglass can break down over time. Um, again, they're pretty decent, but I mean, plastic can break down over time. So the, the issue with cisterns is that there's not really any perfect material for them. Uh, there's even wooden cisterns, but the problem is they leak, and then the, the water has kind of a wooden flavor to it, too. It's not, you know, kind of a woody flavor. Um, have you talked about water distillation yet? No, I haven't. That's another thing that you can do. Um, you can distill water. Um, uh, basically, by cooking it, the steam goes up, and then you can can catch the water going off and it's distilled and it is, gets rid of all the bad stuff and whatever else. Um, so question in New Zealand, they are trying to charge people to use rainwater certain places here too. It's called the three water scheme aimed at the farmers. Rainwater is the main way to collect water in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah, they're, you know, I, I've heard of meters that they're putting on people's, uh, like the rain gutter that comes down into the tank or whatever else. It's insane. Um, can you use a troy ounce silver buffalo nickel to purify the water? Um, can you drink the water, the rain water, and wash clothes with it? Um, if it's a, like a 0.999 silver um you know then yeah i think you probably could um not really familiar with that type of coin uh, but probably you could if it's it's if it's a pure silver then absolutely yeah and can you drink the rainwater and wash clothes with it we wash clothes with our rainwater catchment and we don't filter it or anything else drinking the rainwater we put it through a filtration system like a berkey filter is what we do with that 
question what do you think about biofilters by biofilter i'm thinking you're meaning you know charcoal sand things like that that's another method of uh filtering out water or filtering out impurities in water and yeah that's another possibility of things that you can do with that um there's a lot of really interesting things out there in terms of purifying water so um I don't think buffalo nickels have ever been silver. Pretty sure they are copper nickel. Yeah, I I think I'm not sure that that's what she meant though. Um, if there's there's ones that because see they have these companies coming out and they're making silver reproductions of American coins and whatever else and you know I don't know exactly if it says 0.999 silver on it. Okay, if not, if it's that the buffalo nickels then yeah they're definitely not pure silver. Um, just the same as a peace dollar, a Morgan dollar, silver, quarter silver, dime. Those are not uh, pure silver. I think they're about 0 0.90 silver or something. So, and of course, like I said earlier, just to kind of restate this. Uh, water is going to definitely be one of the most important things um, when you go off grid. And so if you're in a really dry area and there's no rain, you can you can bring you can haul your water in from someplace, but it might not be very convenient to do that. So anybody else have any other questions before we close out this video? And, you know, as, as I've said before, if you could please like the video and uh, share it with other people or whatever else, you know, I'd, I'd like to have these videos actually get rated in YouTube, not just bury them and, and things. So that'd be great if people could do that. Um, okay. I inherited from my deceased uncle. It, it does say 0.999. Okay, good. Yeah, then, yeah, you could use it to filter water. Cool. Um, Question, do you think there's an agenda with Nestle depleting the aquifers worldwide? Nestle, I'm not sure what you mean by Nestle, but um, uh, there, you know, the, the aquifer depletion thing that uh, I forget what the one out in the Midwest is called, but the Ogala or Ola Gala or something like that, um, that one's a really big issue. Um, there's a um, uh, there's a documentary I saw a while back on um, pumped dry I think it's called and just shocking absolutely shocking that how um, the water table has gone down and oh man crazy really a, a bad situation and in the time of Jacob's trouble it's going to be super bad <laughs> with the water turning to blood and everything else uh, so. It's heading in that direction of the water is going to run out. Clean water will run out. Um, question, but not uh, for information. We are in a water war up here. Uh, I, don't, I don't understand what do you mean a water war. Um, okay, Nest, Nestle bottle water bottling company. I believe. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you mean by a water war? I'm not sure there, Brother John. Um, do you do you reoxygenate your water? Um, no, we don't because it's you know running out of a pipe and everything. We're not really concerned about it, you know, getting air in it or anything else like that. Um, so. Okay. Huh. Yeah, I didn't hear about the thing of Nestle Water or Nestle, you know, company doing that. Um, that's crazy. I'll tell you what. Just 
um, you know, what do I think about aquaponics? Um, I, when it comes to growing things, I think you need to put stuff in the ground and grow it. <laughs> uh, you start getting into the aquapon hydroponics, aquaponics, and all this other stuff. I don't know. I've heard people that are really into it, and they make some good arguments. I don't know. Uh, question, have you ever been in a situation where you didn't know what to do going forward? If so, how do you get out of it? Wait on the Lord. Pray. Um, God will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able to bear, but will let the temptation make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Um, he will, I'm quoting scripture there. He, uh, God won't allow you to be tempted to the point where you just fail. Um, and I will tell you, when you get older in years, you'll look back at the times where you didn't know what to do and you thought, oh, this is the end. This is really bad. And you'll realize it was God directing you. Um, the stupid NIV comes out and it says, uh, he'll make your path straight back in the book of Proverbs. That's not what the King James Bible says. The King James Bible says he will direct your paths. You'll come to a point in time where you'll hit a rock and you'll say, okay, there's no way around this thing. And all of a sudden the Lord will say, actually, go over it or go around it or this way or that way. Um, there are situations where you're praying about something and the Lord is judging a certain certain people in your life or certain situations and he just kind of says to you just wait you know um heard some gunshots yesterday when we were at our property and i thought sounded like it was on our land and i said i have to go check this out my son said oh, i'll go with you i said no you don't come with me i'm going to go check check this out myself and um Turned out it was some neighbors that came up to their cabin. They're hardly ever there. And they came up in there. I guess they were target shooting or something. But I didn't even know that they had come. So I just went by. Oh, okay. They're there. You know, hi. And whatever. It was fine. But I had to go in there and take care of that situation. And my son had to wait. And he had no idea what was going on. And he was afraid and whatever. He was out riding around on his, uh, his a bike. with We put skis on it. And he's out riding around his ski bike. And I said, come over here, you know, stay here. Don't go over in that area. I don't know if they're shooting back onto our land and whatever. Everything was fine, but I had to go check it out. So just sorry to get a little sidetracked there, but that's the story I'm having to use to prove my point here. God is doing a lot of things right now. And judgment is one of the big things that he's doing. And a lot of what we're going through as Christians is the Lord just saying, step off to the side, wait, just lay low, read my word, Pray like crazy. I'll be right back. I have to take care of the situation. Um, and so just, just wait. Wait on the Lord. So, um, okay. more questions here how do you get the spring water to your house um in uh seven i think they're seven gallon jugs pretty you know fairly heavy but we just put them in our vehicle and we go home go to where the spring is get our water come back home um not the best situation but it works do you think it's good to train your body to live on as less water as possible now preparing for hard times yeah it's always good to prepare for hard times absolutely um, how is your wife doing? I would love to see her doing a video for women. That would be a blessing. Uh, she's very active building a computer right now. Um, for her, her computer is, um, she's never had a real good, real good computer the entire time. I have the, the ones that are for the video editing and my computers are fast and everything else. And I say computers because I have one that I had. This one here is about 12 years old, I think. I'm pointing over this way. You can't see it, but this one is an older computer. My other one I bought for being off grid and um, both are video editing type computers. Nothing really extravagant or whatever, but they're, they're good computers, old ones, Windows 7 computers. 
she's been getting into the thing of Linux and she's currently building that system. So that's what she's very busy with right now. So, um, but that's going to be it. Um, we're about at an hour, a little over an hour here. So we'll end this live stream. And um, so uh, I think it's about ready to tip into some really weird stuff. Um, I actually heard a guy make a point, and I don't know if there's any truth to this or not, but he said that there's some kind of a weird planetary alignment coming up, and it's going to be hitting, you know, tomorrow on the 222 of 2022, and and that the last time that the planets lined up this way, Pluto and a bunch of others, last time it lined up this way was when the Declaration of Independence was signed, and I'm thinking, okay, I think we have some propaganda here, <laughs> um, but I don't know. There's some really weird stuff about to occur in this country. Um, it would be really nice if I could just say, snap my fingers and everybody listening, all my viewers get off grid homesteads and we're all prepared and we all have a cow for milking and chickens for eggs. And we have, you know, all the animals we want, all the food we want, all the wild animals we want, our perfect little cabin in the woods and everything else because I said so and I snapped my fingers. It doesn't work that way. Um, I'm not as prepared as I would like to be for things to really fall apart. Um, we're all going to have to rely on the Lord if things really get crazy here in the next month or two. Um, <clears throat> there are some things that are shaping up that it could get pretty nuts. And I don't know the Lord's timing on letting things fall apart. In the last days, perilous times shall come. Um, that's written to Christians. That's before the catching up, before the time of Jacob's trouble. So. Perilous times are coming. That's one of the reasons I want to get these videos done to so people can implement some of what I've been saying if the grid goes down where you are or if you are forced into a situation where you have to live off grid to survive. It's possible. People have been doing it for a long time. Okay, You're not going to some new way of thinking. You're actually returning to an ancient way of thinking. Remember that. If you have the right mindset, 90% here, 10% down here. Remember that. It's not work. It's fun. Okay. I'm enjoying this. Uh, this is a uh, really hard labor, hard physical labor, but you know what? It's exercise. I'm staying in good health. I'm out in nature. This is wonderful. I don't, you know, if you have to leave and you're homeless and you're living in your car, well, at least I don't have a house payment anymore. That's great. Hey, Lord, uh, if you want me to meet some people when I'm out here and I'm homeless living in my car, okay. Cross my path with somebody that wants to hear the gospel. Um, otherwise, I'm just going to go out and enjoy looking at nature and, and look at wildflowers and pretty butterflies and whatever else. And, and they are pretty. I'm not being sarcastic. Butterflies are very beautiful little creatures. And see, hear the birds singing in the trees and enjoy those things. Romans 8, 28. OK, uh, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And it begins with for we know that. OK, not to leave out the first part. So <clears throat> that is going to be it for this one. Tomorrow we will be talking about um, the six biggest electric needs when you go off grid. Um, and I say needs kind of in quotations there. We'll talk about that. Um, so, uh, actually now I see where my, uh, the thing of the Ram pump came in. I actually have it on tomorrow's video. So I had, I guess I had a thing here, a note about it, but it's actually going to be in tomorrow's video. So, um, so we will see everybody tomorrow, one o'clock Eastern standard time, Eastern standard time. Um, and so, um, we'll see you then. And thank you very much for watching, and uh, please do continue to pray for us. We really do appreciate that. So see, see everybody tomorrow.